we would all agree that UAP is a global phenomenon, and it is real. But so often the UFO story seems to be centered on North America. Certainly if you watch television. So that raises a fascinating question. How are European countries assessing and dealing with UAP? So I reached out to Lee Dines. Lee is the European advisor to the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies and has also served as the UK National Director of MUFON. The SCU are doing a great job looking at the actual science of UAPs, looking for answers. And just this month, MEP Francisco Guerrero organized a conference at the EU to discuss UAP. Lee Dines was invited to represent the SCU. So today, Lee Dines has joined me to tell you the EU approach to UAP. Hey, everybody, this is a really exciting day. I've got Lee Dines. Lee has just returned from Brussels uh, at a meeting to actually talk about UAP um, uh, with the EU, uh, which is brilliant because obviously UAP are going to be a global phenomenon. So, uh, Lee, welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, tell us about what you did in Brussels and why UAP just need to be global. Well, hi, Simon. Um, I'm Lee Dines, and I'm the European Advisor for the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. Um, as you're aware, SCU is a think tank of scientists, engineers, and other professionals who investigate UAP. Yeah. Um, my background myself, just very briefly, I'm a university lecturer. Um, mm -hmm. I've been interested in studying the UFO phenomenon for approximately 24 years. Um, mm -hmm. I actually got started when I read a book by Richard H. Hall, who was involved in NICAP in the 1960s, 70s, etc. And then I've been involved ever since. Um, and I've been with um I've been with SCU now about four or five years. Prior to that, I was with the Mutual UFO Network, right. where I was their European advisor um, and also a field investigator. With regards to the um conference at the European Parliament, yeah. I was invited. It, um, along with several other individuals from scientifically orient, orientated UAP groups. Um, there were five speakers at the conference, mm -hmm. and then there were nine invent, invited attendees from scientific UAP groups. So the the purpose of the conference was essentially to, it was organized by the MEP Francisco Guerrero, He's a Portuguese, uh, Portuguese member of the European Parliament, right. and he's been interested in the phenomenon for quite a long period of time. So last year, when we had the congressional hearings with David Grush, mm -hmm. um, David Fravor, and Ryan Greaves, yeah. after that um, Congress meeting, uh, Guerrero actually asked questions to the European Commission with regards to UAP. He asked if the European Commission, if any of the member states had provided information related to UAP, mm. or if there was any um, if there was um, any shared information. He also right. asked the Defence Agency of the European Union um, if they had any information on UAP, mm. and he also um, asked with regards if this is potentially an air safety issue. And right. basically the answer that came back from all the different organizations within the, within the EU is we, we actually don't have any information. Um, wow. With regards to, yeah, with regards to air safety, mm -hmm. there are reports that are made by pilots. However, these reports are only really collected if it's an air safety issue in terms of the aircraft being endangered yeah. um, or related to that context. Wow. So Guerrero was quite, uh, probably not putting words into his mouth, was a little bit concerned about this. And actually, a week prior to the conference, he proposed a motion for a resolution um, for the European Union Aviation Safety Agency um, to um, ad adopt a methodology to um, report and, and study in UAP. Right. right. And in, including Simon as well, when that when it's not actually just um, an immediate risk to the aircraft, 
Right. His, his point his, his point was these things need to be investigated, even if they're not a direct safety concern to the aircraft. Um, right. We need to collect these reports. We need to analyze these reports. In the, what happens um, at this time, each time there's a report made, they will have a, if it's an air safety issue, they will look into the report, they'll attempt to identify the object if possible, and then they'll determine if it was a risk to the aircraft. But there actually isn't any analysis of the report right. to see if there's a, um, if there's any correlations, if there's any um, specific characteristics with regards to the UAP. Right. And Francisco Guerrero is arguing this is what we actually need if we're going to take this um, if we're going to take this um, field of study forward. Yeah. Um, UAP exist. They yeah. are a genuine phenomenon. Yeah. They've been with us for. Um, the are a European phenomenon. The um, perspective from uh, from a lot of individuals is that these things are seen in Kansas, in the States, by a farmer. However, that's not true. No, they're yeah? global, <laughs> right. It, it is a European issue, and that's what we were trying to get across at this conference, that the UFO phenomenon, it's global in scale. It deserves serious investigation by competent investigators, and that's what we were trying to get across. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to think things like the Condine Report, which was done by the British MOD in the year 2000 and uh, released public freedom of information by David Clark in 2015, absolutely states that UAPs exist, UAPs are real. But just like the EU's attitude is they're not necessarily a threat uh, to national security, but also the Condine British MOD report said that they could potentially be a threat to aircraft. And we need to get to the bottom of what they are. There's lots of different possibilities of natural phenomenon, plasma effects, man-made things. And it, it's, uh, and as you say, categorizing them just purely from visual sightings. Okay, they're not endangering your Ryanair flight, but you're seeing one. Let's have an actual proper reporting mechanism in the EU uh, and take any stigma away, especially from airline pilots. Is that what the EU think? Is it going to progress that way, you hope? Well, hopefully it will progress. So right. the resolution that Francisco Guerrero um, put across, right. obviously that would, the, the way it works in the European um, Parliament, that would go to a committee that right. will review the resolution. And then if that committee agrees with that, to support the, the motion, then that would be passed generally for a vote. So none of this is in legislation. There's no changes at this time. This is a proposal that has been put forward. Sure. Uh, so... Go over what you know of what, how European countries, specific European countries, um, treat UFO or the UAP phenomenon differently from from what's be, how it's treated in the US. I mean, um, France is often put forward as a as a good example of of having a good categorization system. What do you know about other European countries? Well, I'll just very, very quickly speak about Japan, which is the official agency that investigates oh, yeah. UAP in, in, in France. Right. Um, that agency is part of the French Space um, Agency, right. and they've been in existence for decades now. Mm. Um, and actually, one of the invited guests um, was um, Mikel um, Valent, who is actually a Japan consultant. He wasn't present. He wasn't um, in the meeting. He was actually representing UAP Czech, but he's actually been involved with them for I think about fifteen years. So Japan is still doing research in France. Right. They have um, a good database of sightings, mm -hmm. and they also have some very good sightings that haven't been explained um, via prosaic means. Right. Um, the Transcend Provence case, the Landon case, is, is one example. However, they've got dozens of such cases. Right. Um, however, with regards to other countries, um, the one of the in, invited guests who was a guest, he was actually sitting next to me in the conference, is um, Daniel Ehrmann. He's a German UFO researcher uh -huh. um, from an organization in Germany. Um, and they are doing they have a very extensive extensive database and they are trying to do analysis they are looking for correlations etc with regards to the data however right. as you as you mentioned before um it needs to 
it, it, and the reason we're pushing this to the EU in other locations, the US and Congress, etc. Yeah. We need funds to, to do this effectively. We need funds. It can't just be individual mm -hmm. civilian organizations attempting to do this. One of the initiatives that um, and one of the other um, representatives at the meeting, um, Mikhail Valent, actually, he represents UAP Czech. They're wow. quite a new organization. They're not an organization in terms of um, physical locations or an online presence. And they're actually trying to bring mm. UAP organizations together to share data, wow. databases, et cetera, and work in collaboration to try to address the issue. But if, if we're being honest, if we're really going to address the, UF, the UAP phenomenon, right. we need funding. And that's generally going to come from academia or if, if we can't get it from academia, from the government itself. Yeah. Uh, is there, do you think there's good actual science and physics research going on in, in U EU countries and in Britain, of course? Um, look, do you know of any specific projects that are studying what they could be and, you know, maybe even well, how to... Well, with regards to France, we, we mentioned Japan. However, what, what I will mention, um, my organisation, SCU, yeah. yes, it's... Um, Yes, um, the majority of the members are in the US. We have members throughout Europe, right. including the UK. The SCU actually has consists of over 90 PhDs. Mm. Um, that's a lot. Um, I can't think of any UAP group or organisation. And to be honest, it's probably more than what a lot of governments have working on this um, topic. Sure. For instance, uh, Arrow in the USA who yeah. just recently released their report. Um, and SCU has active projects with all these scientists, many who are in EU countries. There's the Propulsion Project. There's a database project. We've yeah. actually just completed and published a paper relating to UAP um, associated with nuclear sites. Obviously, uh, yeah. we did the study of the Nimitz case. Yeah, um, sure. So and so there there is research being done right. um, throughout Europe. In the there are a range of um, UAP groups in Europe. For instance, Corbeps is oh, yeah. the Belgian UFO group, the Belgian Committee for the Study of Space Phenomena. They've been around for a lot of years. Mm. Probably best known for the wave of sightings over Belgium right. in um, 1989 and 1990. Yeah, um, there's a lot of research um, done into that. But what, what I forgot to mention, Simon, as well, yeah. this isn't a new subject that's just brought, been brought to the attention of the European Parliament. In 1990, you might have heard of the um, politician Elio de Ruppel. Um, he was a Belgian, um, yeah, he, he's former um, Belgian prime minister. Mm. Um, but at the, time, at the time, he was actually a member of the European Parliament. And this is 1990. He actually put across a motion for a resolution for the EU to have an observatory where they would actually study UAP. Right. Now, his his motion actually went to um, a committee. It was passed. It was right. voted upon. Mm -hmm. However, it never it never became legislation um, mm. because there were a few MEPs who resisted it and was specifically mm. with regards to funding. But mm. what they were going to do with that resolution, uh, Japan, which was called SEPRA, I believe at the time. Yeah. They were, yeah. yeah. They were going to use that organization right. to investigate UAP throughout the European Union. Right. However, unfortunately, and I, I, from um, from individuals I know, apparently it was um, two um, British members of the European Parliament who were against this, and it was specifically due to funding that they didn't want to. Um, right. Right. Oh, that seems seems very narrow minded. Because if we talk specifically about the UK, um, it seems that since um, the Condine report was written, that was, from what I understand, that very much was was commissioned uh, to draw a line under and close the UFO reporting desk. And so, when difficult questions were asked in the House to the Minister. Uh, you know, um, the Condine Record could was the referral lookup document, which was the assessment of UAP UFO sightings since World War Two. I mean, are you aware of any anything that anything that's currently going on in the UK? You know, is it are they are they still looking at them or it, 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 officially? Officially, the MOD 
officially is not investigating UAP. Right. Um, that that's the official perspective. The um the desk that was responsible for looking at into UAP reports is now closed. Right. Um and so that there isn't an official investigatory agency. There are, however, civilian organizations within the UK that are still attempting to um investigate UAP. And there's several active groups that are actually involved in that endeavor. Good. And uh, and what about commercial aviation? Um I mean, they. I always think, as you know, as I'm a private pilot. You you see a lot of things in the sky. Some of the things you you learn not to trust your eyes. And um, uh, you know what's the uh, CAA and European you know people uh, aviation authorities doing about this? It would seem to be they would be very good at um, destigmatizing and and actually having a reported database. It, it, and that's what we probably need to look at, Simon, and try yeah. and ad address that with the CAA, et cetera, because, again, they will investigate such incidents if they are reported, for instance, as near misses, et cetera. Right. However, however, the reported, they try to determine what the object was. Was it a balloon? Was it a missile? Or was it actually something unidentified? Right. However, when they come to that conclusion, they'll also state, did it endanger the aircraft? Right. However, w w once that's completed, the, the case is closed. There's no actually analysis. No. Um, and this is what we need. We need to actually try to determine um, what these objects are. Yes. And it's only by doing that then we can actually determine are they a potential threat to aviation. Um, they are, there, are, there are very good UAP sightings where um, mm. they have potentially impacted on air safety and i'm not talking about anomalous lights here there does seem to be a subset of uap sightings a very small percent which do in my view are indicative of um machine-like objects for instance the tic tac object yeah 2004 right. so with regards to the tic tac object we might be thinking was that an air safety issue well the radar operators who scu interviewed right. obs observed these objects at eighty thousand feet Right. The objects would fall to 28,000 feet right. and then subsequently go to just above the ocean. And when right. we do the calculations here, yeah. the, the G-forces are immense. We're talking about thousands of G. But the key thing with regards to air safety is yeah. they were dropping into 28,000 feet, um, as, as you are aware, as a, as a pilot, yeah. is where yeah. we would actually have civilian aircraft, etc. Now, the Nimitz case, it was a military area. Mm -hmm. However, when we interviewed the pilots and we um, did the calculations with regards to their observations of the object, mm -hmm. the object moved so quick. We're talking about potentially hundreds of thousands of miles an hour here when we do the calculations. Right. Um, that the pilots provided and remember with the nimitz case just very very briefly for people that aren't aware of the case yeah. we have two f-18 jets at different altitudes who are watching this object right that, that, that's a key thing as well yeah. so the the aircraft are at different angles uh, different altitudes right. viewing the object however the pilots both well, there's four pilots see the object because yeah. um, each aircraft is two individuals True. it has the pilots and the weapons systems officer and when we when we do the calculations, these things, and we can determine that via we know via visual acuity, um, generally how far people can perceive an object. Yeah. And literally, these the pilots stated that these objects were like nothing they've seen before. One of them described it was like a shot from a bullet uh, right. from a gun. Sorry. Yeah, it yeah, literally. Yeah. So those accelerations would have took that object into civilian airspace very quickly outside of the military zone. Yeah. So they're potentially an air safety issue. Ryan Graves, who tests, um, who actually mm. provided um, a presentation at the EU conference, oh, yeah. the objects, his fighter squadron seen in April um, 2014, so quite recent, yeah. F-18 fighters, there's two FA. The um, he talks about this incident in Virginia where there's two F 18 fighters, they're going up again to do a military exercise. The jets are only about 100 uh, feet apart, however, an object actually cuts through the jets, Whoa. it's less than 100 yeah, feet that between would be shocking. the jets. Yeah. That, that That's an air safety issue, but oh, the yeah. thing is, Simon, yeah. Um, Ryan and the other pilots had been observing these objects via radar and other mm. sensors, such as infrared, 
for months prior and they had been seen visually and nothing was done. And right. the Nimitz case, officially, with regards to the Nimitz case, there was never a, an official investigation after the incident occurred. Mm. Um, yes, later on, ATIP or SAP got involved yeah. in looked at the case. However, that was years down the line. Officially, there right. wasn't an official investigation of the Nimitz case. And, and it's very easy to dismiss them as, um, you know, miss sightings or anomalies. But what you forget is that um, the Nimitz task force group, especially at the, uh, uh, you know, on the radar control ship, have incredibly sophisticated radar. I mean, they need to be able to see stuff which are stealthy and which don't, um, which might uh, absorb normal radar frequencies. So there's types of systems that they probably don't want to talk about where they can uh, see things that, that are pretty out there, uh, great distances over the horizon using space assets as well, which isn't discussed. So I, yeah, no, and, 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 Commander Fravor, David Fravor, is the the Navy's number one ace, you know, chief flying instructor. I mean, what a what an amazing person to have actually had visual sighting of this strange craft, whatever it was. Yeah. Well, all, all four pilots were, to be fair, Simon, and we do okay. know at SDU that all four of these pilots observed th this object. Um, right. Jim Slate was the weapons systems officer in the other aircraft. Uh, Lieutenant Commander, he was also um, uh, a graduate of the Navy, Navy Academy, such as Freva. So you had excellent pilots from different view and yeah, angles sure. observing this object. And what you said about the um, the Nimitz and the Princeton is exactly yeah. right. They had exceptional radar. It the Princeton had Spy-1 radar. Um, right. And we know that the Princeton detected the objects, the Nimitz detected the objects, and also an E-2 Hawkeye aircraft yeah. also detected the objects. Right. So we have multiple sensors, different locations, right. different frequencies that are detecting these objects. And we have the visual testimony before um, very trained pilots. Right. Uh, highly trained pilots. I, 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 of all the so-called Nimitz um, uh, Navy releases, the Tic Tac is the most perplexing. Um, the other, the Go Fast and the Gimbal, could have more prosaic um, um, explanations, although they're also mysterious. But the Tic Tac, what is it? I mean, it's it, yeah, it, the way that it moves, the size of the object, it's into possibly it went into the sea, into medium, whatever we call that facility, is, is, is truly incredible. The, do you think that um, that at a military level, at a kind of security level, kind of five eyes level, things are being shared with European NATO partners? Potentially the five eye um, level, um, that is potentially occurring. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I, I don't have any, um, no one's no. talked no. to me about this officially with regards to that. Yeah. However, it, would, it wouldn't surprise me if that is going on. Um, obviously, the Americans are still. Um, highly interested in, in the topic. I don't know, Simon, did you have the opportunity to um, read the Arrow report that was recently published? Yeah, of course. Of, co of course. I mean, uh, I think it's very interesting because I actually quite like Sean Kirkpatrick and I quite like what that they were set up, but I think he's missing the point. I think by, by saying that 80% are obviously identif easily identifiable, leaving only a small percentage, which are probably balloons. I think it's missing the point that UAP do exist, that there is something out there, a very small percentage, but there is definitely a craft or sightings or objects or phenomenon. I, think, I really like the term phenomenon that need to, to be explained. I mean, uh, you also worked with the wonderful Beatrice um, Valor Royale. I mean, she's working with, um, you know, with the Galileo project. Wow. Wouldn't it be great if they came up with actual interesting stuff and actually using scientific instruments to find, to find what they are? It, 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 and that's what we need to do, Simon. And yeah. the, the key point is there, we need to test hypotheses. Um, and that's what uh, Beatrice and others are doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah. one of the things that really annoyed me in the Arrow report, if we just speak about that very briefly. Yeah. The, 
it, it, it's full of it, it is it, it has many errors so for instance it says the Arnold the Kenneth Arnold site yeah. was on the 23rd of June it was on the 24th of June right. it refers to Project Bear that Project Bear right. was actually a made up name that Ed Ruppelt created with, and it was actually referring to Project Stork and the Battelle Institute study for Project Blue Book, which subsequently became Project Blue Book Special Report 14. Now, if you're doing a historical review, however, however these error, th there shouldn't be errors like that. Yeah. Um, in, in another very basic error, however, it, it just shows that um, right. they probably should a little bit put a put should have put more time into the report yeah. is that they call Robert Friend Roger Friend he yeah. was a former um, head of Project Blue Book mm -hmm. but what I really didn't like about the report is it repeated the suggestion that over the many UAP sightings are actually misidentifications of spy aircraft right you know for instance um, the U two spy plane of things course. like that. However, that 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 can be that can actually be tested as a hypothesis. So, was the U two responsible for half of UAP reports during the nineteen fifties and sixties, right. which is um, claimed? Mm -hmm. The answer to that is no. A study has already been done many years ago by Dr. Bruce Maccabee, oh, who yeah. looked at the reports. So, I think it was um, August nineteen fifty five when the U two first launched. Mm -hmm. He looked at the data. The month prior and the month when the U2 um, launched, reports decreased during <laughs> that month. However, he also looked at six months prior, prior and six months after the launch of the U2. Okay, yeah. And what the data actually shows is that there was 10 additional UAP reports during a six-month period. Okay? Right. right. That is not... That actually equated because I think it was I can't remember yeah. the reports from now, but it was in the hundreds. I think about three hundred reports, but it, it right. actually it was it was a three percent increase, a three percent increase, very minimal, not statistically, not right. not fifty percent. Yeah. Right, so right. what Per Patrick yeah. and the authors of the report have failed to do is mm -hmm. to actually test their hypotheses, and that's what we should be doing in science. You can't make these assertions without evidence to support their viability. That can't be done. However, that's done throughout the report. I think it's so frustrating that um, Arrow and other reports, even the MOD report, however good it, it was, has to keep things secret. I mean, they would know, you know, that, you know, the weird things seen over Utah was actually looking at our data, you know, the test of a of a of a stealth plane. You know, the government and the you know the Department of Defense in the United States would know that. In the same way, you know, in in British reports, I've often had the frustration being uh, living and being brought up in Macrohanish uh, in, in the west coast of Scotland. You can't really get to the bottom of what was it exactly. What was the flight logs of what flew in? Um, I have it on very good authority that even a, a, a stealthy or secret aircraft project, and there are, you know, th there are those projects, would have to file a flight plan, you know, with transatlantic control, and you can't ever get that data. It's so frustrating. And the, it, it, but it, but here's my question to you today, today, Lee: Is do you think it's possible that the whole kind of that there is a military application for the unknown, that they that people, defense contractors, have actually looked at the phenomenon itself and are somehow exploiting it. Yeah, I, I'm very skeptic, skeptical, Simon, of claims of reverse engineering and, and right. other aspects like that. However, it wouldn't surprise me if you had a, a decent defense contractor is looking at some of the characteristics of these objects and potentially the physics involved in, in thinking, can, can we use this? Is this something we can try to mimic or... Um, Yes. Or establish ourselves. I, I think that's certainly uh, a viable uh, thing that that's probably occurring. And um, a lot of the individuals actually that were involved in various government UAP projects, you're probably yeah. aware of this, actually do now work as defense contractors, etc. Okay. for some of these um, <laughs> major aerospace companies. Sure. Yeah, because you're right. By 
you know, the I know the SCU are doing this by l let's look at the G forces, let's look at the flights uh, speeds, and let's see. Well, how could that be possible? What could we? Yes. What what technology was involved? And maybe by at least mentally reverse engineering what was seen and what was recorded, we could kind of work out you know what physics was working there and what you know propulsion systems required you know if if it was if they're going that fast you know they suddenly become effectively spaceship i mean they're you know, you know they have they have escape velocity and i think that's really good that's great that the scu are doing that yeah, we, we actually have a specific propulsion um, project which is addressing okay. those sorts, sorts of, of, of questions. And obviously, um, Dr. Kevin Knuth um, yeah. is a member of SCU, yeah. and he has um, wrote um, um, quite a bit with regards to these accelerations and the motions of the objects, et cetera. Um, so, so there is research going on, and there's some really good research, and um, hopefully it will continue. However, funding is the issue simon to to take this to the next stage we are dependent on funding um as i yeah. said whether that comes from um academia government whatever we do need funding to take to take this forward but eu are not short of funding i mean i was just doing a film <laughs> yesterday on the horizon project you know the the enormous funding for science in eu countries um doing a film about radio telescopes and it's the amount of funding that is available for things which are particularly interesting or particularly novel or could help the eu in some political um um leverage the money's there i mean look at the money that they're spending on ITER and uh, you know and 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 other and cern i mean it, i i i think i really hope that your initiative in brussels um worked and that people will see that solving the uap or at least identifying better databases looking at shared characteristics will be funded and it's the uap uh, coalition of the netherlands as well which were very um, heavily involved in um, arranging this meeting and um consultant with Fra Francisco Guerrero and right. trying to put this on the radar. But what, what I need to emphasize, Simon, I think it's important for people to be aware there's still much stigma and that includes yeah. within the European Union, the European Parliament, et cetera. And, and this is what we're trying to do. And this was the point of the conference to show actually there are scientists, there are competent individuals right. involved in studying this um, phenomenon. Um, and we need to try to reduce that uh, ridicule factor, which, which still exists. Um, I mentioned before that SCU has 90 members with PhDs. Yeah, yeah that's great. However, a lot of these members, or well, it's a smaller percentage, but it's still it's still a percent, don't want their identities revealed because right. of where they were, they're involved in academia, et cetera. Yeah. And a lot right. of that is because the stigma remains. Yeah. I'm sure. going to be perceived as the UFO believer, you know, and yeah. <laughs> that's still an issue which we do need to try to address. I, and the the media have been terrible. I mean, I just, yeah, they reported uh, UFO stories. It's just another, it's just another flying saucer story for them. And they're not really looking at the science. They're not looking at the facts, really. They're just doing sensationalism. We have to break through this and we have to, we have to make the general public aware that these things exist. They're really out there, and we we actually need real data on it. I mean, they're not necessarily a threat, but to understand what they are, where they come from, are they intelligently controlled? I mean, that that you know, that's something that humans need to do in the twenty first century. And again, I would say a small percentage of UAP reports are potentially indicative of intelligence, whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, yeah. If yeah. the Nimitz case, for for instance. But there's there's many, many, many other examples. Right. Um, but again, with regards to the stigma, it relates to the pilots as well, because we know that pilots are having observations and that many of them are not reporting their sightings. Right. I remember a report done in 2001 by NORCAP, National Aviation Reporting Centre on Anomalous Phenomena. Um, oh. Dr. Richard Haynes was the senior scientist for that organisation. He yeah. was a former NASA research scientist. Mm. Um, 
the details of that report, they put a survey out um, to one of the um, airlines in the USA. And the respondents to that survey, out of the pilots that had reported UAP sightings, or sorry, who had seen UAP, right. um, 75% didn't report the sighting. 75% of mm-hmm. the to- of the pilots, this is commercial airline pilots, sure. did not report the sightings. There was a variety of reasons for that. However, uh, one of the reasons was that they didn't know who to report to. Right. <laughs> Another one of the reasons was it was just too strange. It's too strange to report. And that, that's where we get back into the stigma issue in, in other aspects like that. And we need to try to address this. Uh, certainly in commercial aviation or even any aviation, as soon as you are, um, if you, you come back and say, I saw a flying saucer, you know, it, it, you know you, your fellow pilots will laugh at you and, you know, is he mentally stable? Well, you might have seen something really odd and it needs to be reported. That stigma needs to be completely removed. And I, hopefully that is is happening now but i i worry that um apart from the scu and a few other smaller organizations um i want just want as coming from a science background i want to see more science i want to look at the physics of what's what are they there i mean it, it it's not very obvious that they're actually a solid craft i mean it opens up a lot of possibilities of physics and our universe but it should be exciting, shouldn't it? We should yeah. want to try yeah. to determine what is going on here. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it's exciting. What is actually behind um, the UAP phenomenon? And it's not one particular thing. There's various phenomena that encompass the U, the UAP phenomenon. Yeah. Oh, well, well th- thank you, Lee. You. It's so good that you had this meeting. And I really hope that with the kind of media interest in the US, and it's all coming over to Europe as well, that the European Parliament and EU and funding, which is the most important thing, and individual countries can actually do something in Europe. Because as I said at the beginning, you know, this is a global phenomenon. It's not just as you said in Kansas, you know, it's everywhere. So we need to have people like you and the SCU and the EU actually interested in this. So uh, congratulations on your initial meeting. Um, what What's going to happen next? What's the next stage? Well, we're going to keep doing the work with the EU. Um, obviously, we're going to see what uh, occurs with regards to the resolution. Um, like I said, it would usually, like I stated earlier, it would normally go to a committee, then right. they'll decide to support the resolution, and then it would be a vote if there was any potential change to legislation, procedure, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, however, we want to keep this work up. Um, we will um, continue to engage um, with members of the European Parliament. However, right. not just parliamentarians, anyone else who right. is interested um, and is able to support us in addressing um, the phenomenon. That's the work that we're definitely going to continue. And through, do you think we can help slightly through social media? Uh, uh, can people contact their uh, MEPs or, 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 or obviously join organisations? I mean, uh, yeah, I think p- yeah. people can certainly contact their MEPs to, to show that this is a serious subject that deserves right. serious attention. Um, however, with regards to joining organisations, people can join the UAP organisations that do exist. And there's a lot right. of organisations that exist throughout the for Europe. Um, and obviously, the SCU is always looking for new members as well. Or... Um, there's a... And there's a lot of information on our website with regards um, to that. Mm-hmm. Um, just very briefly, Simon, if I can mention, it is yes. our conference. It's going to be our fifth. It's our. Um, this is going to be the fifth conference that SEU's um, held. It's going to be in Huntsville, um, Alabama, Rocket right. City. However, it's also going to be online as well. It's going to be online. Um, it's from 31st of May to the 2nd of June. Uh, Beatrice uh, Villarreal. Um, doctor is going to be one of the um, presenters, but there's um, Ross Kevin, Coulthard yeah. is, is going to be there. Kevin yeah. Knuth's going to be yeah, there. Great. Various speakers. So all the information is on the SCU um, website. 
Oh, people should definitely do that because um, I think you're really uh, at the forefront of looking at the science of the unexplained. So thank you very much for today. Um, my viewers are certainly going to love hearing what you're doing in the EU and congratulations. So th thanks, thanks, Lee, very, very much. This is a good chat. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Yeah, bye, bye. Oh, that was really fascinating. Thanks, Lee, and good luck with your approach at the EU. Here's a link to the SCU conference in Huntsville, Alabama. You can register now. Link in the description.